Hello everyone and welcome to this webinar about achalasia and what you need to know. My name is Ali Sederat and I'm a gastroenterologist at UCLA. Don't forget that you can ask questions via social media at Twitter or at Facebook. So we're going to uh, talk about a few things here. What is achalasia? Define it. How do you diagnose it? How is it treated? And what's new in the management? And this is something that we're very excited about and, and my particular area of expertise in achalasia is a procedure called POEM, and uh, I'll tell you more about that. So what is achalasia? It's uh, defined as incomplete relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter in a, a response to a swallow, and an absence of normal peristalsis or normal muscle activity of the body of the esophagus. And that results in food not being able to get from the mouth into the stomach because the esophagus doesn't do what it's supposed to. The esophagus is normally a conduit for food to get from the mouth to the esophagus, and it does that in a very coordinated way. And then when it's disturbed, you can have severe symptoms. It's important to realize that to diagnose achalasia, you have to exclude other obstructing lesions, such as tumors or scar tissue. A little bit of background, achalasia is relatively rare. One in two patients out of 100,000 will have it. The cause is unknown. It's a, a result of inflammation and degeneration of nerves in the esophageal wall but what causes that injury isn't entirely clear. It may be an, an immune response to a previously exposed virus. Zoster has been implicated, so-called shingles virus. Measles, herpes simplex. Um, these have been hypothesized, but nothing is, is certain for primary achalasia. There are secondary causes of achalasia that are much less common, but, but are important. In other parts of the world, such as South America, uh, secondary cause is Chagas disease, which is called by the parasite uh, Trypanosoma cruzii, transmitted by the kissing bug, which is uh, depicted here. Um, that's rare in this country, but common in, in the develop wor developing world. Uh, another reason for achalasia are secondary, that are secondary causes are perineoplastic syndromes. And what that means is a tumor, such as a lung cancer, can secrete antibodies and mimic the pattern of achalasia. Other secondary causes, pseudoachalasia, is, is a tumor of the esophagus or the stomach causing findings that are similar to achalasia. So a lot of the testing in a patient that we suspect has achalasia is, is looking to exclude some of these other diagnoses. Males and females are, are uh, affected equally. It affects all ages, uh, as young as toddlers, and the oldest patient that I've seen was 94. Um, there's no cure, meaning that we can't make the motility or the muscle go back to normal, but we can do a lot to fix the symptoms and, and get you back to a very close to normal quality of life. So how do you know if you have achalasia? The chief symptom is dysphagia, meaning I can't swallow. Uh, it's often progressive, meaning it gets worse over a period of time. It's often to both liquids and solids, and it can be very disturbing. Food gets stuck in the, in the mid-chest and upper throat. The location may be variable and may not indicate where the actual level of obstruction is, uh, but that tends to be the chief symptom. And all these other symptoms are really kind of a result of undigested food not exiting the esophagus to enter the stomach. So you can have regurgitation of liquid music, uh, mucus or undigested food, weight loss because nutrients aren't getting where they're supposed to go. There can be pain in the chest, pressure, fullness, there can be aspiration or choking uh, sensations, especially when food comes up at night um, and can enter the lungs. That can be very disturbing and can even cause pneumonia that can be serious. Heartburn is possible. Um, it's usually atypical and chiefly doesn't respond to normal antacids. It's often initially sometimes difficult to distinguish achalasia in the early stage just based on symptoms alone from normal acid reflux, which is far more common. Um, the heartburn that people get in achalasia, though, is not due to acid. It's usually due to fermentation of food in the esophagus. Um, it's very important that specific testing is needed to diagnose achalasia, even in the presence of all these symptoms. So how do you know if you have reflux, which is much more common, versus achalasia? The bottom line is that you need to be tested. You can't tell just from uh, talking or, or examining you. Um, but some alarm symptoms in, in patients that have reflux warrant further investigation. The main one is that most patients that have reflux, difficulty swallowing is usually not a dominant symptom. And if it is, that should be investigated. It may not mean that there's achalasia present, 
Uh, there may be something else present, but that needs to be investigated. Weight loss is an important alarm symptom or red flag regurgitation, as we talked about. The presence of anemia or bleeding is important. And of course, if there's a family history of cancer or other gastrointestinal disorders, now that needs to be investigated. So how do I, how do I figure out if you have achalasia? Uh, there's a couple of tests. The, the, the first three there are the main ones, an upper endoscopy where a camera is inserted into the mouth and into the upper digestive tract to examine uh, the esophagus, stomach, and first part of the small intestine. That's, that's an important test to, uh, to look for causes of difficulty swallowing. An esophagram is a type of x-ray where you swallow some dye and a radiologist takes pictures as the dye moves down the digestive tract. And there are specific patterns uh, that are present in a normal esophagus versus achalasia versus other disorders of the esophagus. Manometry, especially uh, the recent advent of high-resolution manometry, and we'll go over what that is, is a way to measure the pressure in the esophagus during a swallow. And those patterns are very specific to the diagnosis of achalasia and sensitive to picking up that diagnosis, especially when combined with these other tests. And that's important that uh, achalasia is a syndrome that's diagnosed in combination with your history, your physical exam, and a, and a, and a variety of tests. There's no one single test that says you have achalasia with, with certainty. In some patients, other testing is necessary to exclude other disorders. CT scans, for example, to, uh, to look for a tumor that may mimic achalasia, especially in older patients or patients who smoke. Uh, pH testing is sometimes required uh, when there's difficulty distinguishing motility disorders of the esophagus versus reflux um, and, and overlapping types and some syndromes. So I'm going to show you here uh, what a normal endoscopy of the esophagus looks like. This is just a quick short video that we'll play. Um, and this is basically just the endoscope going down. You can see the esophagus is relatively straight. There's minimal to no fluid. And the esophagus opens very easily without spasm into the stomach. So just keep that uh, image in mind and you'll see what an achalasia patient's esophagus looks like in a second. This is a normal esophagram. The patient swallowed a column of, of dye, often barium uh, or other types of dye, and x-rays are taken. And it's a straight tube relatively all the way down, and contrast passes easily into the stomach. Um, this is normal. An abnormal esophagus, this is a patient of mine that has achalasia. It's pretty typical of achalasia. The esophagus is more dilated. The contrast tends to stay in the esophagus and doesn't really enter except in a delayed way into the stomach and it comes down to a pinch, and this is the spastic area of the lower esophageal sphincter that's preventing uh, food and, and liquids to go down. And this so-called point is called a bird's beak, which is somewhat uh, typical of achalasia. This is a more severe patient of mine who you know, uh, has progressed over a little bit of time. You can see not only is the esophagus very dilated, but contrast is, is kind of filling around uh, all this um, shaggy stuff, which is food that has been retained despite this patient fasting. The esophagus, in addition to becoming dilated, is now tortuous. It's become what we call decompensated. And, and generally, once you get to these stages, the symptoms are more severe. This is a patient who doesn't have achalasia but has esophageal spasm. And you can see these areas where the contrast is being squeezed. These are simultaneous, non-propulsive, meaning that they don't move the contrast down, but they just spasm in a way that can be very painful and cause difficulty swallowing. So this is not achalasia, but it's a different dy uh, dysmotility disorder of the esophagus. Uh, that uh, This happens to be jackhammer esophagus is what we call it. So there's different types of achalasia. They're categorized based on the manometric pattern. And it's important for us to know what type you have uh, because your treatment may be slightly different. And we primarily figure out what type of achalasia that you have based on manometry. So this is a normal high resolution manometry. Color is pressure. Low pressure is blue. So for example, here in the stomach, there's not too much uh, pressure. Um, high pressure is in the reds and purples. This band going across is the upper esophageal sphincter in the neck. And the way that this kind of graph works is that this is distance and this is time. So if we're starting here, a swallow happens. The, this opening is the upper esophageal sphincter. And then with time, the esophagus is transporting the bolus down into the lower esophageal sphincter and into the stomach. And importantly, with the swallow, the lower esophageal sphincter pressure relaxes. So you can see here the pressure has relaxed and it goes back to normal 
but in between when the swallowing has happened, the lower esophageal sphincter opens. This is in contra uh, distinction to a patient with achalasia. He's made a swallow, the, the upper esophageal sphincter, which is under voluntary control, has opened, but nothing happened in the esophagus. There's zero pressure. Um, this is aperistaltic, classic achalasia. The lower esophageal sphincter also has stayed closed. It didn't open at all. So this patient probably has pretty severe symptoms. This is what's called type 2 achalasia. There's also a closed esophagus in response to a swallow, but there's some pressure. This is called pressurization. Um, it's important for us to know because this has some prognostic implications. Patients with type 2 achalasia tend to do better with, with whatever um, uh, treatment they get. Um, but this has a little bit of pressure, so there's still some squeeze left in the esophagus. These patients tend to have symptoms, but they're probably on the more uh, mild side of the spectrum, uh, though they can also be severe. This is type 3 achalasia, a swallow again. The lower esophageal sphincter again didn't open, but what's important here is that there's very high amplitude non-propulsory spasm of the body of the esophagus. So you can see here that these numbers are very, very high. So type 3 achalasia is also called spastic achalasia, and often patients with type 3 achalasia have chest pain. Uh, type 3 achalasia is important because the spasm goes very high. Uh, it was previously harder to treat with surgery until POEM uh, came along and, and made it a little bit more effective to treat these patients. So what's the treatment for achalasia? So this is just kind of a history for your interest. Uh, achalasia was, was, it was described four or five hundred years ago by Sir Thomas Willis, who's pictured up there. He called it cardiospasm. And he treated these patients by taking a whalebone that he fashioned into a stiff dilating rod and basically, hopefully gently, passed that into the uh, patient's gullet and stretched the muscle open. And that was pretty much what happened for 300 years until Dr. Ernest Heller uh, showed us how to do a myotomy, which is a surgical way to cut the muscle to relieve the spasm. Um, and then over you know, the 20th century, some, some progress has been made modifying the surgery, making things laparoscopic, adding what's called a fundoplication, which is an anti-reflux procedure uh, to the myotomy. Um, a little bit later, uh, balloon dilation was introduced. Um, in the 21st century, POEM was introduced. So for about six years, Dr. Inouye, Professor Inouye from uh, Japan, taught us how to do uh, POEM in humans, and, and he was the first to do that in humans. Uh, so medical management uh, is usually not all that effective. Uh, medications work about half the time, but generally they have intolerable side effects. And so their use is limited by those side effects, and you have to kind of keep taking those medications. So what are those medications? They're generally medications whose side effect is relaxation of smooth muscle. Uh, we use those occasionally, uh, but not very often. Botox, uh, botulinum toxin, is a, uh, a protein that uh, basically paralyzes muscle. We, we probably are all very familiar with its cosmetic use. It's also used in other parts of the body. And uh, it's, it was injected, or it is injected, into the lower esophageal sphincter to allow it to relax. And it's effective, it's safe, it's very easy and quick to do an outpatient type of procedure, but the problem is that it's temporary. And so you have to be a little bit careful in who you uh, select to have Botox. In general, it's not a very good effect, uh, long-term effective option for an otherwise healthy person that can tolerate um, uh, a different modality, which we'll go over. So Botox is useful in patients that are too ill to undergo other procedures, or if the diagnosis is in doubt. Sometimes we'll inject Botox as what's called a therapeutic trial to see if your symptoms get better with paralysis of the muscle. And that may indicate to us that, for example, cutting the muscle with the surgery may be effective. Uh, what's important is that repeated injections lose their efficacy. So after maybe two or three injections, it may not work as well or at all. The injections are temporary, generally weeks to months is, is what's typical, and then the symptoms come back to where they were. And important for us as, as physicians who treat achalasia is if you have Botox too many times, the scar tissue can make more definitive therapy, such as uh, surgery or POEM, uh, a little more difficult and a little less safe. So um, if, if Botox has been offered to you, um, you should kind of maybe ask uh, why something else hasn't been offered. and, and uh, um, uh, seek care uh, in a place that we can, we can take care of you more definitively. Uh, pneumatic dilation has been around for, for a few years. 
it's the standard of care in a lot of parts of the world and a lot of parts of this country still. Uh, and it's a good option, a balloon, and it's a special balloon. It's a large diameter, uh, stiff balloon. Uh, and it's important to know if you're getting a pneumatic dilation versus a, a, what I call a regular dilation or a gentle dilation. Most gastroenterologists are very comfortable doing a through the scope small caliber dilation. We do it all the time for narrowings uh, in the GI tract. Pneumatic dilation is a little bit special because it's a larger, stiffer balloon. Uh, it has a little bit of special training required to do it properly, and it has a little bit higher risk. So if, if you were told that you're getting a dilation for your, for your achalasia, you should know which kind it is. Pneumatic dilation is effective, and it can be durable. Other types of dilation are generally uh, ineffective or very temporarily effective. What's nice about it is, is that it's easy to do. It's an outpatient um, uh, procedure. It's quick. What the disadvantage is that you may need several dilations to achieve relief of your symptoms, and then you may need over your life several dilations to maintain that efficacy. So for that reason, it's fallen a little bit out of favor. Uh, in addition, there's about a 4% risk of damaging the esophagus that may require emergency surgery. And so that often scares both uh, patients and physicians uh, away. Though I, though I have to say that in our experience, that rate is probably a lot lower than that. Um, so here's just a quick cartoon, you know, the balloons pass through, it's inflated, it stretches that muscle, and it doesn't quite break the muscle, it seems to just stretch it out of the way, which is, which is why, for the most part, most patients over their life may have recurrent symptoms requiring repeated dilation. Uh, this is the Heller myotomy, this is the standard in, in, in most parts of this country and increasingly around the world. It's usually done laparoscopically with about four or five incisions that are tiny in the abdomen. Um, and uh, this is just a schematic where uh, the muscle layer here is cut. This is the stomach, this is the esophagus, this is the diaphragm. And that muscle, that spastic, is cut for a few centimeters on the stomach side, a few centimeters on the esophageal side, and including the lower esophageal sphincter. And in this case, a posterior or toupee wrap has, has been done. Uh, and that's uh, basically to reinforce the cut muscle, and it serves as an anti-reflux procedure. This is important. If you, if you like, you can kind of think of achalasia and reflux as the opposite. You know, in reflux, the uh, lower esophageal sphincter relaxes inappropriately and allows acid to go into the uh, esophagus. In achalasia, it's too tight and doesn't let food go down. So if you treat achalasia, there's some real risk of uh, replacing that with reflux. To deal with that, surgeons perform a wrap where part of the upper part of the stomach is wrapped around the esophagus to reinforce it uh, to allow uh, acid to stay down. It's not 100% effective, but it's pretty clear that the risk of reflux is less uh, if you do a Heller myotomy with uh, a fund application. Now, it may not be appropriate for all patients to have one uh, on a case-by-case -case basis, but probably most. Uh, complications are generally low. Uh, one to five percent is the coded leak. Our surgeons are excellent at this, and, and uh, they're probably on the lower side of that spectrum. It generally requires a few days in the hospital for pain control, recovery of bowel function, advancement of diet, etc. Uh, but it's a very good option for, for a lot of patients. Uh, the disadvantage of, of, of this operation, chiefly uh, in terms of technically, is that when the, when the surgeon comes from the abdomen, he can't go very high in the esophagus. Um, so for patients that have a lot of spasm in the esophagus as diagnosed by their manometry, even if he goes as high as he can, there may be portions here that are uncut and symptoms may persist. Um, an important thing about this diagram is that uh, in terms of the reflux, when the surgeon goes in to, to do this myotomy, he has to undo a lot of the normal connections uh, that protect against reflux. So a lot of the body's an anti-reflux barrier is not just the sphincter, but it's the connections of the stomach and the lower esophagus to the surrounding structures. So when the surgeon goes in to sex all this out, uh, he has to basically um, fix it a little bit uh, or put it back together to prevent reflux. And so this is in distinction to, to POEM, which we'll talk about. Uh, shortly. So um, a last resort sometimes for some patients, a very, very small minority of patients who have severe dilated tortuous, so-called end stage, stage four, uh, or late stage, sigmoid esophagus, these are different terms, um, requires surgical remover of the entire esophagus uh, and hooking up the um, stomach kind of higher up in the chest. That's obviously a major operation. Um, it's usually only considered for someone who has failed other interventions, so meaning a myotomy has been attempted but was uh, in, ineffective. Um, that's a major operation. We try to obviously avoid it. The good news is at UCLA we have fantastic thoracic surgeons and they have very good outcomes. So 
Uh, if you're one of those patients that require that, uh, you'll be in good hands. We want to try to capture you before you get to that stage. So what's new in achalasia? This is what kind of my, my specialty is, uh, is poem, peroral endoscopic myotomy. Peroral means it goes uh, through the mouth. Endoscopic means it's with an endoscope, standard endoscope that we use uh, every day. And myotomy means cutting the muscle. So it's basically a way to make a really great surgery, which is the Heller myotomy, a little bit better uh, and a little bit maybe less invasive. So it's a less invasive means of achieving uh, the uh, same thing with the surgery. So it's incisionless, it's less invasive. In my experience, I think there's less recovery uh, and people kind of get back on their feet and out of the hospital quicker. It's very effective, greater than 90% in most studies, and the risk of complications is, is very low. Um, and it's, so it's been remarkably safe. It's been around for about six years and it's been widely adopted throughout the world. Thousands and thousands of uh, patients have had POEM throughout the world, including the United States and it's had an excellent uh, safety and efficacy record. So we're very, very excited about that. And we're excited to be able to offer it to, uh, to our patients here at UCLA. Um, so who can have a poem? Uh, basically, poem is designed for achalasia. Uh, and so anyone that has achalasia of the different types, especially type 3, uh, is, is appropriate. Um, there's expanded indications, if you like, for, for patients that have non-achalasia spastic disorders of the esophagus. And uh, those patients sometimes are a little bit more difficult to, to manage. So people with esophageal spasm, nutcracker, um, jackhammer, those uh, patients may be potentially candidates for POEM. POEM is doable after uh, previous surgery. So if you had a Heller myotomy years ago, but you have uh, recurrent symptoms, which happens in a small minority of patients, we can still do a POEM. Uh, it can be done, or at least attempted, with very severe achalasia and sigmoid esophagus. The efficacy is probably a little bit lower but it's still pretty encouraging and, uh, and something to consider, uh, especially before esophagectomy. And it's been performed uh, in extremes of age. It's been described as young as uh, toddlers at uh, one or two years old. Um, my, my oldest patient was uh, 92, I want to say, 93. Um, so uh, age is not necessarily a reason not to, not to do it. Um, but there are some reasons when you can't. So if there's severe lung or liver disease, that's an important uh, kind of stop uh, button. Um, if there's problems with uh, clotting of the blood, whether that's from a primary disorder of the blood or from medications that can't be held or discontinued, blood thinners, etc., um, then, then we, we may not be able to do a poem. Importantly, if there's severe scarring in the esophagus, and that may be from radiation from a prior tumor in the chest, or it may be from removing a, a, a tumor endoscopically, like a polyp or a little uh, mass in the esophagus or, or ablating or burning something in the esophagus, such as Barrett's esophagus, that may make uh, a poem un, uh, not feasible because of the scar tissue. So how do we uh, prepare you for a poem? Well, you, you come and you see me in the office and, and, I, and I tell you uh, all about it. Um, and uh, we first decide if you're an appropriate candidate for all the reasons that I kind of mentioned. And then we have to make sure that it's safe for you to undergo anesthesia. So a lot of uh, what we do is a preoperative anesthesia assessment to make sure that um, we can safely anesthetize you in terms of your heart and lung health, etc. Um, if you're on blood thinners, those need to be managed. Aspirin is probably okay. Uh, other blood thinners uh, probably need to be stopped uh, if, if, uh, if possible. And uh, we'd have to work closely with your internist, cardiologist, neurologist, uh, hematologist, whoever uh, is managing. Prior to the poem, um, it's very important to have the esophagus cleared out. And uh, so for 72 hours, you'll, you'll need to be on a liquid diet. And that seems like a lot, uh, but uh, you'll be surprised what your esophagus may have despite liquids for three days. Sometimes we'll give about a week of an antifungal. It's called nystatin to, uh, to, to basically uh, kill any fungus that may be there. A lot of patients with achalasia get colonized with yeast, so it's like a thrush or a candida infection of the, uh, of the esophagus. And then obviously nothing to eat or drink prior uh, uh, to the uh, uh, procedure at midnight. Uh, it's under general anesthesia. You're paralyzed to keep you nice and still and safe. You're given IV antibiotics for infection prevention. You're given IV steroids to help with swelling. Um, you're given um, potentially an arterial line, which is like an intravenous line, but goes in the artery to monitor blood pressure. We don't do that in everyone, but the anesthesiologist may do that to help uh, manage you while you're asleep. And we take precautions against aspiration. One of the main risks of um, anesthesia in patients with achalasia is that when you fall asleep, the food that you think is, is not in your esophagus, but is, and has been there for a few days, may come up and go in your lungs. So we can take some precautions, and we've done very well with that so far. 
So this is a poem. This is just kind of a cartoon. This is the endoscope. This is the esophagus into the stomach. And the endoscope is tunneled in the wall of the esophagus uh, all the way down to the stomach and then the muscle is cut. This takes advantage of the layers of the esophagus. Uh, there's uh, a mucosal layer that touches the food uh, that's superficial. The deep layer is the muscle layer. That's what we're trying to get to. And in between is submucosa. And the submucosal separation or delamination, as we call it, is what we depend on to safely do this procedure. And so what's separating us from the muscle is this mucosal flap. And that's what the tunnel, as we call it, is made of. On one side is mucosa, on the other side is muscle. And we're basically tunneling very carefully through the submucosa. So here's just a quick video of a poem, just uh, so you can see how it's done. So this is a patient with achalasia, very spastic. It takes a little bit of pressure to push through. Uh, this is the initial injection or the entry site into the um, esophagus. So we inject a fluid to separate the mucosa from the muscle and allow us to safely cut, which is what you're going to see here. So roughly one inch or so, a couple centimeters incision is made with an electrocautery knife um, down into the esophagus to allow an entry point into the wall. And that's what we're doing here. That blue dye that you'll see faintly, we use that so that we can distinguish the layers visually a little bit better. It's, uh, it's just an inert, uh, benign dye um, that's injected uh, with the uh, saline that we use to irrigate. And then these little gauzy, wispy fibers, these are submucosal fibers, and we're kind of trimming and cutting those so we can enter the tunnel. And this is now the, the tunnel starting to be entered. Here is now the muscle. This is the submucosa, and if you can imagine three-dimensionally, this area will be the mucosa. And so now we're injecting some fluid to expand that layer uh, so that we can safely tunnel through it. And you can start to see now these circular muscle fibers running across these white ones. And you can see where the dye helps you visually distinguish where the muscle is and the submucosa is. And so this allows you to safely do the procedure. So we're using electrocautery to very carefully cut fiber by fiber uh, the submucosa. To give you an idea of size, this uh, shaft of this knife, this thickness, is about half a millimeter. So this is very, very fine stuff. Everything is very magnified here. Um, the uh, uh, part of the dissection here uh, involves identification of, of blood vessels. These blood vessels can bleed and so we need to isolate them very carefully like we're doing here and, uh, and cauterize them prophylactically so they don't bleed. So we have instruments to do that. This is a coagulation forceps and we very gently uh, capture the vessel and cauterize it so we can safely proceed without bleeding. Severe bleeding happens uh, in a very small minority, one or two percent or less, and uh, is usually manageable um, endoscopically if we need to. So now the tunnel is complete. This is the mucosa. This is the muscle. The submucosa has been dissected away. This is the lower esophageal sphincter, and it's gone a few centimeters into the stomach. And so now we're ready to cut the muscle. So this is the muscle layer being cut. This is the circular muscle running this way. So the esophagus is kind of like this. Okay, so there's an inner circular layer, there's an outer longitudinal layer. For the length of the esophagus, we focus on the circular layer. Once we get to the lower esophageal sphincter, we cut uh, a full thickness myotomy or all the layers of the muscle. And so now you can see here, this is the uh, longitudinal muscles here. On the other side of this are the thoracic and, and structures, heart and lungs, things like this. Here's the lower esophageal sphincter uh, going down and getting cut. Oops, looks like we paused by accident. Oh, there. Kind of choppy. So now the muscle is cut completely, and you'll see uh, on this side is mucosa. This is all of the muscle cut completely, all the way down to the stomach. And uh, once we come to the end, we just basically close that entry site. So now you can see a little bit more clearly the muscles divided or cut all the way down and now the, the spasm uh, will be relaxed. And this length of muscle that's cut is variable. It can be uh, as long or as short as we want it depending on what your manometry tells us uh, is necessary. So that's the entry site. We can go down now into the esophagus and you can compare now how open this is compared to what it used to be. This is nice open. It used to be nice and spastic like that. Now after the myotomy, it's open. So you can imagine before, food couldn't go down, and now it can. And then we uh, close our opening with uh, clips 
uh, to basically, uh, uh, similar to suturing, um, close that incision. And that's the last step. And uh, our, our closure is pretty robust and prevents leakage. And that's what it looks like when it's closed. And these clips fall off uh, usually within uh, a week or two. You won't probably even notice them. They just kind of pass into the digestive tract. And so that's it. So after the poem, you get admitted to the hospital overnight. It's an observation outpatient type of setting. Uh, and we just basically you have a boring night of watching TV and us making sure that you don't have any complications. Nothing to eat or drink. And uh, we give you pain medicine if you need it. Nausea medicine, um, whether you think you need it or not, it's important not to throw up uh, during that first day. The pain medicine, remarkably, very few people need a lot or any narcotic. Some people have zero pain, which is, which is pretty, pretty remarkable. You're even antibiotics. Uh, and then that next morning, we repeat the esophagram, you swallow the dye, chiefly to look for a leak. If no leak is present, you're fed. And if you do well, you don't have any pain when you eat, you go home. You're discharged on a, a si soft diet. And that's important. So you may think you can eat a lot more after your poem, but it's important to only eat a soft diet for two weeks. Soft means anything you can swallow without chewing too much. Uh, antibiotics for a couple days. And then we assume that you're going to get reflux, whether you do or not. And I'll tell you about reflux after poem in a second, but we send you home on an antacid. After two weeks, you can advance your diet. And then I see you in the office in a couple months. And then we do our post-poem testing, uh, endoscopy, uh, et cetera, as necessary um, uh, there. So in terms of outcomes, it's, it's very, very uh, promising and, and encouraging. People are very excited about POEM. More than 90% of patients do fantastic with resolution or near complete resolution of their symptoms and their lives are completely changed. They can eat what they want to, they gain weight, uh, and, and, and generally very happy. It seems to be comparable to heller myotomy and maybe for some types of achalasia better, potentially for type three. Uh, and there's ongoing comparative trials looking at POEM versus other, other um, other uh, modalities. The main side effect is acid reflux and anywhere from 15 to 40 percent of patients can have acid reflux and uh, we'll talk about that. Um, so we briefly mentioned that other non-achalasia disorders of the esophagus may be treated with POEM. The efficacy is probably a little bit less but it's still much better than what we previously had to offer. So you may or may not be a candidate but it's definitely something to ask your doctor about. Uh, adverse events, serious adverse events are very rare, one or two percent or less. Minor stuff that we can manage uh, is also relatively rare on the order of 10 to 15 percent. Uh, in general, the uh, prognosis of achalasia is um, progressive, meaning that it will get worse if you don't do anything and it can get difficult to manage. Um, about 10 percent or so of patients can progress despite treatment or they can recur and require additional treatment. In general, the recurrent treatment after a myotomy, whether that's POEM or Heller, is treatable. And importantly, if you've had previously a, a Heller, you can have a POEM. Um, there's evidence that in patients that have achalasia, there's a higher than normal risk of esophageal cancer. And that tends to scare people understandably a lot. We don't understand that 100%. Um, there's no evidence that screening necessarily uh, picks up those patients. So we don't know, for example, if you should have a yearly endoscopy after your achalasia has been diagnosed uh, or after it's been treated. Uh, that uh, remains to be seen, but most people would probably say that at some point you should have your doctor at least see you in the office and, and discuss screening uh, for cancer. Um, so achalasia is rare, but important motility disorder of the esophagus. It can lead to significant symptoms. Specific testing is needed for us to know if you have achalasia and to, and to type it. Uh, see if you have type 1, 2, or 3, or another spastic disorder. There's no cure, uh, but there's a lot of uh, good options, and, and especially a new option. For most patients, a myotomy is probably the best option, whether that's a Heller myotomy by a surgeon or a poem by a gastroenterologist is, a, is often a personal choice, uh, but there are some, some instances where a poem may be superior, and there are definitely some instances where a Heller may be superior. Uh, so POEM is exciting, it's new, it's, it's less invasive, and it's something that we're very excited to offer at UCLA. Um, we've been doing this for the last year and we've had some really good outcomes and very happy people. Acid reflux is the main side effect of my myotomy. And uh, I tell patients that sometimes you're going to trade one disorder for another one, but a disorder that's more easy to treat. So reflux is generally a lot easier to manage than achalasia is. 
Her poem, we had touched on this a couple of times, no one knows exactly um, if poem or heller myotomy is better at preventing uh, or, or, or better in terms of a side effect of achalasia. So no one knows for sure if heller or a poem has more, um, a more, uh, more reflux, I should say. Uh, for the most part, we think it's about the same. Um, those are some, some important details that you can uh, talk to your doctor about. Or if you have any questions on, on uh, Twitter or Facebook, you can let me know. I can go in some more detail. Um, but the good news is that even if you do have reflux, it's manageable with medications. It's important that about half of patients that have reflux post a myotomy won't have symptoms. That's why we send you home on, a, on an antacid after your poem. Uh, and that's why we test for acid a few months after your poem to identify you for asymptomatic or silent reflux and decide if you should be treated, even if you don't have heartburn. Um, it's very important to emphasize that a multidisciplinary approach is key. So we're very lucky at, at UCLA to have a lot of smart people around us, uh, much smarter than me, who, who can uh, help us manage very difficult patients. So surgeons that are really good at their jobs, gastroenterologists that are really good at their jobs, radiologists, physiologists, all these kind of people come together and we have a weekly uh, or bi-weekly um, esophageal conference where we go over endoscopy images, manometry, uh, for individual patients and try to come up with a group consensus about uh, the best management options. And that's pretty much it. Uh, I'll remind you to submit your questions to uh, uh, Facebook and Twitter uh, and be happy to answer them. And thanks very much for tuning in and joining. And I look forward to, uh, to seeing you. So here's some questions. So the first one here is reflux more common after Heller or poem? Okay, that's a good question. So we'll go into a little more detail. So the, the rate of um, reflux after a Heller myotomy uh, without a fund application, without an anti-reflux procedure, is up to 30-40%. When a surgeon adds that fund application, which is probably pretty standard for most patients, that risk is reduced uh, to maybe 10% or less. Um, however, the problem is how do you define reflux? And a lot of those older studies where those numbers came from, reflux was des des described primarily by symptoms, and we know that half of patients uh, don't have symptoms. So those numbers may be underestimating. If you go by a little bit more stricter definition, there may be higher numbers, and the same applies to POEM. The risk of POEM, the risk of reflux after POEM is probably on the order of 15 to 40 percent, uh, depending on how you measure it. And the real answer is that it probably depends. So probably people that have a hiatal hernia, which is when the stomach is into the chest, and obese patients, uh, those patients probably have a higher risk of reflux. Those patients may be more appropriate for a Heller myotomy than a poem, because then the hiatal hernia can also be fixed at the same time. Alternately, uh, a poem can be done, and if reflux is a problem, a, a, a hiatal hernia repair can always be done afterwards. Uh, as a backup option if, for example, antacids don't work. So the, the true answer is, is somewhat unknown, which causes more reflux. We think they're probably about the same. In some patients, um, a poem may cause more reflux than others, but uh, certainly a Heller doesn't guarantee against reflux either. So I think it's a little bit of a personal choice in a case-by-case -case basis. Um, which kind of brings us to the next question. How should I choose between a Heller and a poem? Um, for standard type 1 or type 2 achalasia, it's, it's mostly a personal choice. The main advantages uh, are that it seems to be less invasive, quicker recovery, back to kind of normal life, out of the hospital uh, a couple days sooner. So generally a 23 hour or less observation stay in the hospital versus maybe one or two or three days. In my experience, patients with POEM have less pain requiring narcotics in the hospital and afterwards than patients that have a Heller myotomy. And that's a consideration that's important uh, for a healthy person that wants to get on with their life. Um, but that's also a personal choice. That's the main medical, medical issue. It's incisionless. Some people are, you know, don't want surgery you know, and scars and things like this. I don't think a cosmetic issue should uh, make your decision for you. Um, and I would consider a poem an endoscopic surgery. So it's, it's, it has you know, rare but major side effects just like surgery. Um, but the less invasiveness is appealing to a lot of people. Um, POEM is probably better for patients that have spastic disorders of the body of the esophagus. So type 3 achalasia, jackhammer esophagus, these types, 
probably heller myotomy uh, seems to do less well because the surgeon just can't get up into the esophagus as well. Um, uh, so I think it's, it's a little bit of a personal case-by-case -case type of a, um, a decision, and we often make those decisions at that multidisciplinary conference uh, here at UCLA. Uh, what's my risk of cancer? So the, the risk of cancer with achalasia is, has been described in a couple of uh, uh, population-based series. That risk can be up to 15 or more fold compared to the normal population, or a lifetime risk of about 3% has been quoted. Um, however, we don't know what to do with that number. So we don't understand the physiology of it. Um, we think it may be related to stasis. It may be related to something primary uh, that has to do with achalasia. Uh, what hasn't been clear, though, is that what, what should we do to prevent it? Um, is it something that we should screen all patients with achalasia, meaning that at some arbitrary interval every year, every two years, every five years, do an endoscopy uh, to look for early cancers that can be treatable. No one really knows. My practice is probably to offer that to patients, have a frank discussion like we're having now, and say, if you would like, I'm happy to take a look uh, in a year or two. Um, it probably doesn't need to be yearly, probably doesn't need to be even every two years, um, at least not long term, but maybe every three to five years. It seems like that risk um, you know, can persist even after treatment. So even if you had a poem or a heller, there may still be a slightly elevated risk compared to the normal population. Uh, it's important though when we're talking about this cancer in terms of achalasia that we're talking about patients who truly have primary achalasia and then develop cancer later. Um, a minority of patients at diagnosis have cancer. Those are more the pseudo achalasia or secondary achalasia patients. And a lot of the testing that we do is to try to make sure uh, with you know, endoscopy, endoscopic ultrasound, CT scans, everything that we need to do to as best we can decide that uh, it's unlikely that you have cancer as the cause of the symptoms. Um, that last question here is, will my insurance cover POEM? Uh, that's a good question. It's difficult to answer, and the answer is mostly yes. It's a newer procedure, so a lot of insurance companies uh, haven't uh, quite uh, figured out how to put that in their algorithm of payment. Um, so we have a pre-authorization process. Our office works very closely with you and your insurance company to get approval uh, so that you don't have to worry too much about it. If there's a problem, I advocate on your behalf, make phone calls, write a letter, whatever I have to do to help. Sometimes in that situation, we are still unsuccessful. Um, in that situation, the options are basically to appeal, independent review, uh, either through the state of California or through your insurance company, uh, to pay out of pocket, or to look for an alternative treatment, and that could include a heller myotomy. Um, so that's it. I guess we'll stop there. Uh, look forward to uh, uh, hearing from you. If you have any additional questions, feel free to contact us at our UCLA website or on social media. And um, uh, looking forward to uh, hearing from you. Thanks very much.